Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today, joining me, as always, you know him, you love him, from scotttodd.net, landamoto.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, hostingdomination.com forward slash the Land Geek, Scott Todd. Scott, how are you? Mark, I'm awesome. How are you? I'm great. We closed seven deals. Uh, no, I'm uh, sorry, eight deals last week. Oh, uh, you're killing me. You're killing so, me. It was a great week. Um, very, very fun. The market is strong. <clears throat> and um, speaking of markets, I'm really excited about our guests today on the art of passive income. Yeah, we're, we're going to take we're going to take today, and we're going to go global. We're going global, and you know we've never gone global. Um, right. From the Land Geek podcast to the Best Passive Income Model podcast to today's podcast, I don't think we've ever gone global. We've had people, we've had, you know, uh, speakers globally who are, who are in different countries, but never someone who specialized in global investing. So today's yeah. guest is Bobby Casey, a managing partner of Global Wealth Protection. Global Wealth Protection. That sounds fantastic. GWP helps clients from around the world internationalize their assets and take advantage of unique investment opportunities globally. Bobby is a lifelong entrepreneur, investor, and student of life. He's a believer in privacy. Privacy, Bobby, privacy is like gone now. And <laughs> and fights this fight through words and actions around the world. Is renowned a speaker on Anakar how do I even pronounce this? Anarcho capitalism, free market economics, and offshore business. Mr. Casey travels the globe working with like minded clients, helping them properly structure, structure their businesses and their lives to minimize risk and maximize reward. He's smart. He holds two undergraduate degrees BS in finance, with minor in economics, BS in international business with a minor in Russian, master's in entrepreneurship from MIT. Bobby Casey, how are you? Hey, Mark. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me on today. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So, Bobby, internationalizing assets and taking advantage of unique investment opportunities globally, how the heck do you do that? Well, this, this has been my business for, for quite some time. Um, I, I've had a lot of different businesses over the years doing lots of different things. But around 2001, I started, let's say let's call it informally helping friends and other, you know, but, uh, my, my sphere of influence, my entire adult life has always been entrepreneurs. And so I, I really, everyone, all my friends are all, they all run some type of business. And around 2001, I, I, I basically started helping people protect their assets um, by creating proper structures. And that kind of evolved over time. And then 2008 is when I sold, I sold off, uh, another business and started doing this kind of as a full-time gig. But basically, basically our deal is we help people internationalize their business, their wealth, and their life. We're big believers in international diversification, not just, not just from an asset standpoint, but also take advantage of global opportunities with your business and also internationalizing your life as well. I, we, we think uh, all that stuff is, is important. But I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Scott Todd, what do you think? I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I find it very uh, exotic. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like uh, th this, this sounds like uh, we, we got to go deeper and, and explore internationalism here. Sure. How, how, yeah. how, how do I do this? Yeah, so we, at least, at least a lot of my readers and followers are familiar, but maybe your, your readers are, and listeners are not. But there's a concept called the multi-flag strategy. Uh, there was a book written years ago called the five-flag strategy back in, God, I think, 60s or 70s, I believe it was written. And the idea with the multi-flag strategy is really taking advantage of jurisdictions geographically um, where, where, it, where it seems to fit. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Maybe, maybe you decide you want to... God, what's an example? You, you really enjoy surfing and you really enjoy uh, a nice 
year-round warm climate. So you decide, I'm going to plant my residency flag in Costa Rica. I'm going to live down in the southern part of Costa Rica, go surfing every day, and kind of uh, enjoy my lifestyle around, around this surfing, surfing culture. So that's, that's one flag. That's your flag of actually where you, where you call home, right? You don't have to be Costa Rican to live in Costa Rica. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of Costa Ricans, they want to leave there because they want to plant some other flag too. I have a lot of Costa Rican friends. And so that, that's one idea. You plant that Costa Rican flag as a place where you live. That's where you call your home. But maybe you don't really actually do business there. Maybe you have, it, you know, maybe in some of your listeners' case, maybe they have a real estate business. They're investing in different types of uh, uh, raw land or they're investing in maybe um, – residential housing or apartment buildings or, you know, whatever, they're investing in some type of real estate deals. So maybe they look at, maybe they think uh, an excellent opportunity for real estate investment right now, I'm just hypothetically speaking here, let's say uh, single family homes in Kansas City. So now they're planning an investment flag in Kansas City with some of their, their real estate investments. Now they think, okay, where's some opportunity, maybe I can uh, buy some some bulk land, maybe divvy this up, sell it off, or make some money selling some land. Maybe they find an opportunity, and I'm, I'm using this as a real example because I have a good friend of mine who does this, who uh, deals in land in Panama. So you can buy up, uh, depending on what part of the country you're in, but Panama is a great opportunity to buy some cheap land, divvy it up, do some development. So now you're planting another flag. Right now you've planted three flags, Costa Rica, Kansas City, and Panama, right? You follow me? I'm with you. I'm with you. So now maybe you register your company from an asset protection standpoint. You want to get your company registration in another country because you want to take advantage maybe of the tax tax opportunity, tax, tax rates there. Um, or maybe some banking opportunities there. So maybe you use an offshore jurisdiction, for example, maybe Anguilla in the Caribbean. You decide to register your company there and that's where you operate the, let's say that's your quote unquote home office, but you're not physically there. So now you've planted, what are we at? Costa Rica, Kansas City, Panama, and Anguilla. We're four flags now, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Now, just hypothetically, let's pick a fifth flag and let's say you like to go on ski trips in the winter, Switzerland. You spend a couple of months a year in Switzerland going skiing. That's your fifth flag. That's your playground, as they call it, your playground flag. So that's, that's kind of the idea of the multi-flag strategy. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a very personalized approach. People have different goals, different needs, different areas of expertise. You know, I have a recent client who's a, a doctor. And he was trying to figure out he, how he could move out of the U.S. and, and um, kind of internationalize his life. But as a doctor, he didn't realize uh, or, he, or he didn't recognize, let's say, how to move his medical practice license into another country. And that's, you know, that's he spent his whole life, his whole career, his whole education about becoming an MD. Well, he ended up finding a chain of dermatology clinics in Colombia, and he's in the process right now of buying a chain of clinic, not a big chain, but five or six locations. But he's not actually going to be working physically as the doctor. He's really going to be a consultant running the business, but he can still transfer his knowledge as a dermatologist into running these chain of five or six clinics in Medellin, in Medellin and surrounding area of Colombia. So every, everyone has a different situation. Those are just, just some hypothetical examples well one of the real examples so so basically you you take someone's <laughs> desires to, to do all of this stuff and you you act like a, as a consultant for them i guess and help them to to realize what they want to do correct yeah i mean that that's part of it we we have a, a membership group i'm, I'm not going to plug it here but we have a membership group where people can join and we create a lot of content around that. Like if you want to get residency in Costa Rica or Panama, or maybe you want to, maybe your grandparents were from Italy and you want to cre reclaim your ancestral citizenship in Italy and get that second passport. Or maybe you want to know the best opportunity and the easiest way to live in the European Union without 
having um, a job or registering a company there. Uh, maybe you're looking for real estate opportunities internationally. So we have a membership group that, that kind of helps guide people in that way. And then beyond that, I do individual coaching to people who want to kind of sort out the details personally. And yeah. then so um, we have a couple of other businesses where we do we have a corporate service business domestically and we have a corporate service offshore where we help uh, people register companies. We do, we provide registered agent service and uh, company management. So yeah. how did you get started in this? <clears throat> oh, wow. It, that's one of those things like you, you, you kind of go a little bit down the rabbit hole and you, you learn a little, a little bit more and a little bit more, but I used to own a bunch of different businesses over the years. I think uh, I counted fairly recently. I've started about 13, 13 companies over the past 20 years. And um, I've, uh, I've, I've bought actually, in addition to that, I bought, uh, I think four or five other companies that I merged with another, another company. And during that time, like, well, during the time around 2001, I, I just kind of needed to develop an asset protection plan for myself because I felt like, well, I own a couple of different businesses. I have some real estate here. I had some raw land here. And I thought, you know, I really need to do something to protect my assets because the U.S. is quite litigious. I, at the time I was living in the U.S. I don't, I don't live in the U.S. now. But at the time I was living in the U.S. and the U.S. is – ridiculously litigious. If you go to the American Bar Association website, you can look at the stats on it. You can look at the number of lawsuits filed every year. If you do the math, it comes out to be about one lawsuit filed every 16 and a half seconds. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite a large number of the number of lawsuits filed. And if you have assets, if you have a business or you have land or you have uh, any type of real estate investment, you, you're really just you have a target. I mean, you have a bullseye because anything that happens, you actually have assets where a creditor can pursue them. So from my own personal standpoint, I realized that years ago that I needed to do something about that. And I got, I, really intrigued with it. I got really intrigued with the, uh, the idea of protecting one's assets. And that's kind of how it started going down the rabbit hole. And, you know, you just kind of <laughs> one thing leads to another, I guess. You know, Bobby, this is really interesting to me because um, it's one of those things like we all kind of, you know, we see on TV. Right? Um, like it makes me think of that movie uh, with Tom Cruise. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where he goes and they have offshore accounts. You, you know, the, the firm. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The firm. Right. The firm. right. And so it, it seems like okay, this you know this is for really wealthy, sophisticated people who've got massive net worths and they've got to protect their assets and you know they don't want to pay forty percent in taxes and here's a way to to do it right or I, I think of the, of uh what was that Wolf of Wall Street movie uh, yeah. You know, he's going to Switzerland. You know, we hear about the Swiss bank accounts, you know, the recent scandal with, with all that and the, the you know, um, you know, people kind Panama of getting, papers. the Panama Papers and, and people getting outed about all that. So it kind of has this sort of um, nefarious type of tone to it. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, A, uh, it's, I, for me, it's like FOMO, like fear of missing out. Like, like I talked to a buddy of mine He's got, a, he's got a company in Zimbabwe and he takes out $100,000 a year tax-free in Zimbabwe. Yes, he's, he's taking advantage of the foreign earned income exclusion. Uh, as an, well, I assume you're talking about an American guy, right? He's an American guy and he goes yep. there and, and it's, it's, it's amazing. So it's like, I feel very jealous when I hear these stories. And um, so I, I find it very fascinating, but... What does anarcho-capitalism mean? Anarcho-capitalism basically is, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of um, it's, it's a more in-depth philosophical discussion, but anarcho-capitalism essentially is anarchy, right? And right. 
anarchy itself, the term anarchy gets a lot of uh, let's say negative attention because it's misused. And anarcho-capitalism really is just anarchy. The delineation between anarchy and anarcho-capitalism came because there's other people that claim to be anarchists that actually misuse the the original intent of anarchy. So people came up with this term anarcho-capitalism. But anarchy really is just the the idea that we we don't need to be ruled, that we're really the people best designed and best uh, charged with making decisions in our own lives that we don't need to actually have rulers. So essentially that's, that's the idea behind anarcho capitalism. It's ultimately, it's really just free market capitalism. It's, Hey, I've got, uh, I've got a bushel of apples. Hey Scott, you want to buy my bushel of apples? You know, I sure. like oranges. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, okay. All right. So you're going to have a tough guy here. All right, I got you. I got you. But Mark will buy them for half price. All right, so basically I'll, the I'll, idea is... I'll, I'll, I'll buy them 20 back. cents of a dollar. Right. Yeah, you guys are real estate guys, of course. You're trying to get, get a deal. You're trying to always get a deal. <laughs> but any, anyway, basically that's the idea. Basically, I have a bushel of apples I want to sell you. You want to buy them? We come to terms on a price. Done. That's it. It's just free market capitalism. And that's ultimately the idea is that we don't need people to direct and control our lives. Yeah, this is really interesting. So I love the quote, own nothing and control everything. John mm -hmm. D. Rockefeller. But essentially, what does that really mean? Yeah, that's, um, that's really, a, for, from our perspective, the way we talk about it, it's essentially a way to own your assets. It, in your case, and probably a lot of your clients and a lot of your listeners' case, I imagine they're real estate investors, they're buying land, or, or maybe they're buying other types of real estate also, and this is just a piece of their portfolio. Well, th the idea is you don't actually put your name on the title of that property. You Maybe you own it in an LLC's name or a land trust, or maybe you own it in an LLC's name and an irrevocable trust owns your LLC. So it's, it's just an idea where you actually still retain control over the asset, but it's not legally yours. Um, I want to go back to address a point you brought up a minute ago where it, you said the perception is that people think they need to be uber wealthy to take advantage of offshore strategies. Yeah, I, I think that is the perception. Am I, am I wrong in thinking you, that? You're not wrong in that it's the perception because it absolutely is the perception. And I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, I had a call with a new client and the guy, he just did an intro call to start anyway. And <clears throat> he said, I'm not really sure I'm in within your target audience of clients because I don't think my net worth is high enough. And I said, okay, well, let's have a little chat about what you got, what you're doing, what your net worth is. Come to find out the guy was worth about $10 million. Okay. I was um, 45, 50 years old, worth about $10 million. And basically through the conversation with him, his perception was he was nowhere near wealthy enough because his circle, his sphere of influence, all his buddies were 50 to $100 million net worth guys. And he was kind of the, he was the pauper in his sphere of influence. But ultimately, I, I tell people, if you're going to consider any type of offshore strategy for your wealth, your business, your life, it, you need to think about what it is that you get and benefit. I mean, obviously, if it costs you $10,000 to set everything up and you get $1,000 in benefit economically, that's just stupid. Why would you do that? But I have a lot of clients who are, um, I like to call them digital nomads. A lot of guys, I don't know if you've heard that term before, but... I, I have heard it. Could you tell us what that means? Sure. Digital nomad is basically guys that run some type of location independent business and they can live and work from anywhere in the world and a lot of them do. Now, how they do that really varies because I know guys that go live three months in... Uh, Thailand, and then they'll go live three months in California, then they'll go live six months in, in Budapest. And they're not like 
really quick movers. They spend a longer period of time when they move. And I have other, I have other clients and other friends who they don't stay in any place more than two or three weeks. They are constantly every two or three weeks getting on a plane to a new place. They're, they basically live their entire life like a tourist. Now, in my experience, a lot of times those guys kind of burn out on that after some time, and then they'll end up picking a home base somewhere, and then they'll travel from their home base. That's kind of what I did. I was very much a digital nomad for a while, and now I kind of picked the home base. I travel a lot, but I still come back to my home base now. But I have a lot of clients that are digital nomads. Maybe they're running some online e-commerce store or they're selling products on Amazon. They're not huge, super uber wealthy guys, but they're making fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month, thirty thousand dollars a month. Good money, but certainly not what I would call uber wealthy. Um, but they're you can easily you can easily restructure your business in a way to save tens, if not a hundred thousand dollars or more in tax. Uh, just by getting the business properly structured and in, in their situation. I have uh, some some clients that are, they have some pretty significant intellectual property that they, you know, I, I have like I have one client in uh, the, the southern part of the U.S. who has a, a medical business. He owns a very significant amount of intellectual property. He's not a nomad. He lives in the same house, in the same suburban neighborhood with the same white picket fence he goes to and from every day. But in his case, he, he, he basically shifted his intellectual property into a lower tax jurisdiction to take advantage of some tax savings um, by doing that. So there, there's a lot of different strategies you can employ depending on the person, but you don't have to be uber wealthy. There's, you know, in the digital nomad case, the guy making 20 grand a month, you know, Maybe it cost him four, five, six grand to set everything up, but he saves 50 grand a year in tax. He's not uber wealthy, but spending five to save 50 is a kind of a no brainer. Right? It, it, it really is spending five to, to save 50 every year, right? <clears throat> I mean, that's. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. Time. Every year. So, I mean, it's kind of a no brainer to take advantage of those type of opportunities. Now, Bobby, what about the argument that says, well, if we all do this, Who's going to pay for the roads? Who's going to pay? For <laughs> Who's going to pay for the? Oh my God! My favorite, you know? my favorite arguments. Right. Um, ironically, the road the road mm. argument is kind of funny because roads are typically paid for by uh, fuel tax, federal and state fuel tax. So if you're driving on the roads, you're paying for it. You're not getting out of it. Schools are typically paid for by property tax. So if you either own or rent. If you live in the jurisdiction, I mean, if you live in Atlanta, Georgia, and you're paying property tax at your property, or you're paying rent and your landlord pays property tax, you're paying for the schools. Okay, so with my property tax, I'm paying for schools. With my sales tax, I'm paying probably for a lot of stuff, right? Um, who, knows, who knows what on sales tax? Who knows what on sales tax? Um, we're already paying for the roads. So... Where else does my tax dollars go? Well, about 25% of your tax dollars go towards military spending, for sure. Uh, about 25% of your tax dollars go towards basically debt service now, um, service, paying the interest on treasury bonds. Not, not, <laughs> not principal payments, but interest-only payments right now is about 25%. Um, and then apparently the other 50% go to $1,000 toilet seats. <laughs> oh, there's nothing wrong with a thousand dollar toilet seat. Sure, as long as you earn the money to sit on it, right? <laughs> true, true. Uh, now, okay, so I see what you're saying about like the digital nomad. What if, what if I want to live in America? I want to live right here, but I want to take advantage of this. How do I do this? Like, like, can I do it? I want to buy land here in America. I want to live here in America. I mean, I would love to live in Costa Rica. And I don't know, about two years ago, I tried to convince my entire family, like, let's, I had a, I had just sold my house. I had a big check in my hand. I'm like, let's ditch this whole planet head to South uh, Costa Rica. My daughter said, okay. Everybody else said, no. How do I do this? <laughs> well, it sounds like you're a terrible salesman, first of all. I am, probably, yeah. <laughs> you, you need to, have they been? 
No, I, I was like, hey, let's just go. Yeah, just uh, see, don't do that. Take, take them on a two-week vacation to Tamarinda. Yeah, maybe. Take them on a two-week vacation. Let them like it. Let them figure out if they like it. Don't, okay, don't take but, them to San Jose, though. San Jose is a terrible town. Okay, so then, so Mark takes his family to Costa Rica for two weeks. He's ready to go, but his wife says, no deal. How do we take advantage of it? <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it really depends on the way the business, the way your business is structured. I, and I can't tell you exactly in your personal situation, but for example, maybe you want to start diversifying some of your investments offshore. There's certain, certainly some benefits to that. Because, I mean, we, we call it geo-arbitrage or just geopolitical diversification. Because maybe you say, well, maybe I don't want to live in Costa Rica full time. Maybe I just want to buy a couple of uh, vacation condos down there and rent them out and make some money. Make some money down there. You can leave some of that, some of the income offshore. So, so for example, you set up an offshore company that buys two or three or four, whatever, vacation condos down there that's making some money every month. Well, as long as you don't bring, and I don't want to get into too deep of a tax discussion here, but essentially as long as you leave the income for the business outside of the U S you're not taking personal benefit of it, immediate benefit, then you can, you can leave the income there and it can actually grow tax deferred. So now that's a significant thing. I see. Growing I see. Tax deferred, right? So you make $100,000 and it's tax deferred and next year it makes another 10%. It goes to 110. If it's after tax and you're paying 40%, now you're only 60 goes 10%. You follow me? I'm with you. So you have a, a, a tax deferral growth rate there. Whereas year two, you got 110 outside of the U.S. Year two in the U.S., you've got 66, you know, <laughs> You follow me? That, I'm with that, you. Yeah, I'm with you. That compounding effect escalates rather rapidly, and it gets significantly better the longer it stays out. Now, of course, I call it tax deferred because it's not tax free. Ten years later, you say, you know what? I got this really amazing deal I want to make in Wyoming, and I need a million bucks. Well, bring that million bucks stateside. Now that becomes taxable income to you again. But it had ten years to grow tax deferred too, right? So there are, there is some significant benefit. Okay. I'm with you. I'm with it. Okay. <laughs> but maybe nice. if you don't want to physically move and become an expat or you, you know what I mean by expat, right? Yeah. 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 You don't want to become an expat. You're not interested in becoming a digital nomad. Maybe. And I have a lot of clients like this. They're really just taking advantage of investing overseas. You know, maybe they want to buy some real estate, some apartment or condos or some land or, you know, like I have, I have a friend of mine, um, a client of mine who just bought two hotels, one in Latvia and one in Italy because he wanted to diversify his portfolio. Um, so, you know, I mean, those are, those are things you can do. They're not necessarily becoming a nomad or an expat. That's just, that's one piece of the puzzle. That's not right for everybody. Yeah. Know, but it is right for some people. I mean, that's cool. I, I think it's really interesting. My, my fear, personally, the reason I haven't ever invested overseas <clears throat> or in Central or South America with, with raw land, um, it's just fear of, of government, right? Like, I, I, it's, it, it, you know, we know what we're getting here, right? Um, it feels very solid in the U.S., um, despite all our, our warts. But in those areas, it, it feels very risky to me. Am I just is, this just, is this just U.S. anxiety? Is this an irrational fear, Bobby? In, in some ways it is, in some ways not. I mean, personally, I wouldn't buy property in Guatemala or Honduras. Um, but I would definitely buy property in Panama. One, one of my business partners owns a ton of property in Panama. I have a lot of clients that have bought property in Panama. Panama, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been to Panama, but Panama economically is killing it. I mean, they've been growing, their GDP has been growing 8% or more for the past at least 10 years. Um, when the U.S. had a, a crisis in 2008 and 9, Pan, Panama didn't even know it happened. So, 
It's, it's funny because, um, you know, like you, you had mentioned like cheap land in Panama and I hear that I'm like, okay, I got to go see this. And so I, I head over to some websites and I start looking and it's funny because there, there is, there is affordable land there, but you know, like when I search on like the lowest, the highest, and it's all relative, you know, like, cause I'm, I'm thinking like cheap land, now I'm buying some cheap land here in, in America and I'm looking like the cheapest lot I find like for sale is like a uh, half an acre half an acre yeah half an acre for like ten ten thousand dollars i got a deal on my desk right now for like a hundred dollars for an acre like mm-hmm. this is it's all relative right but it it does i mean it's beautiful it looks beautiful i could buy a mark we can buy an island over there 215 acres i, I would love to buy an, an island as long as i knew that the government was going to just wake up one day and take it <laughs> you know yeah that's that's a that's a funny topic, actually, and uh, Scott, I'll, I'll mention that, too. I mean, you know as well as I do, land, just like any other real estate deal, is all about location. So <clears throat> I would say you need to do a little bit a little bit of research on it if you're really serious about land in Panama because, you know, I, I can go buy land in the middle of nowhere in Montana, too, for a couple hundred bucks an acre. <clears throat> but, you know, I don't know what what good it's going to do me to have – you know, a 500 acre track of land in the middle of Montana where there's no town, you know, where there's no, I mean, there's lots of different ideas, North Dakota, you know, maybe I'll, maybe, I, you know, I don't know the marketplace, but then again, maybe this piece of land in Panama is, you know, in a vacation town right by the beach. I don't know what you're looking at, obviously. Yeah, it, uh, it but, looks, it looks rural. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I guess it's, it's, it's funny because you know, there's there's opportunity all around you. Everywhere you look, there's opportunity. Sure. And uh, I think that when when you look at whether whether you want to look at real estate uh, abroad, I think that the that the smart thing to do though is if you're gonna go do something outside of America, then you need to engage someone like yourself uh, to 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 be your guide to to get this thing done correctly. Because otherwise, you could be leaving a boatload of money on the table. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to say the same thing, Scott. I think you can't, or you shouldn't. I think if you're going to responsibly do this, I think you need a Bobby Casey, someone who really knows, is an expert in doing all this and can point you to the right areas, set you up properly. I feel like the stakes are so high. The risk and the reward ratio could be amazing, but you need a Sherpa like Bobby Casey, an expert to guide you. I think to go out and do this on your own and, and just be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy some land in Panama. <laughs> and, and You'd be crazy. You know, would be, You'd be crazy to do that, no doubt. Yeah, so I, I really think that to be responsible, and I think from our point of view, like as a, being a podcast guest, I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest anybody just go online, start Googling, you know, Doing in doing this, I, I think you need a body Casey. Honestly. Yeah, but you know, like Mark, we, you and I both know, like we, we know somebody who, no matter what he's gonna do, he's gonna go. We, this individual we know, he's gonna go and he's gonna hire like the best, right? You know, like he's gonna go and he's gonna because he wants to not shortcut the process, but he wants to get into the mind. He wants to leverage the mind of other people, and I think that that's where a lot of people whether it's whether it's foreign investment or even in what we do with land, a lot of people, they try to shortcut it and say, I got it. I, I can go be my own attorney. I can go be my own, you know, surgeon. And in fact, you shortcut, you do shortcut the process when you go to an expert like a Bobby, when you do look at, at you know, whether it's the investor's toolkit or whatever, whatever is out there to help you learn how to, how to do something, it's an investment, but then it's also helping you to, to shortcut it because you have a knowledge base and experts behind you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, yeah. it's what you don't know you don't know, Bobby. Yeah. I have a great yeah. example if you want to hear it. A friend of mine a few years yeah. ago bought a condo in Panama. And um, <laughs> he, he basically bought this condo. He went and looked at it. It was a pre-construction deal. The building was almost finished, but it was pre-construction, so the inside was not was not finished. He he decided to, as you know, as you said, Scott, he decided to be his own lawyer, be his own real estate agent, deal directly with the developer, 
And the, the end result was he got delivered the property. It was a completely, I guess you would call it a white finish. Um, he was under the impression it was a completely finished condo on the inside. But in, in fact, it didn't even have tile on the floor. It didn't have cabinets. It didn't have doorknobs. It didn't have ceiling fans. It was a completely white finish. You had to build out the inside 100%. Well, he thought, okay, so I kind of screwed up there. I didn't, you know, you know, he's reading a contract in Spanish. He's not fluent in Spanish. He decided to kind of work through it on his own. For all I know, he was using Google Translate to, <laughs> to translate his contract. And he said, okay, I screwed up. It's going to cost me a few thousand bucks to finish this thing out. So he built it up. He did it. He's like, God, I love this place. It took him almost two years to get title to the place. He actually did not get the actual deed. And he lived there. He had the key to the door. He had access to the property. But it took him almost two years to actually physically get the title in his hand. And he had to spend quite a lot of money in lawyers to make that happen because they did not have a clear ownership structure with the developer. And a lot of that was because he tried to shortcut that system on the front end and be his own lawyer and be his own agent and so on and so forth. And he ended up shooting himself in the foot. I mean, okay, it, it all worked out eventually, but it took him quite a lot of time. And in the end, he actually spent a lot more in lawyers to fix the problem than he would have spent had he hired the person on the beginning to make sure you didn't have the problem from the start to clear up the contracts and all that stuff. So, but that, that can happen. I mean, that can happen anywhere, I guess. Um, but I would definitely say Latin America, it's much more likely to happen. And there are certain parts of Latin America where it's very, very difficult to actually even own property like Mexico in uh, Mexico. Foreigners cannot own coastal property that's in a protected area. Um, you can buy property that's two miles in from the beach, but there's plenty of developers that are trying to sell you coastal condos um, when in fact you can't legally take title to the property. But those are things you wouldn't know if you didn't know the market and you didn't, you didn't have the, the, the expertise from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, Bobby, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot now and okay. I'm going to ask you for your tip of the week a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What do you got? Okay. I, I'll, I'll give you all of that stuff. So my tip of the week, if you're, if you're a serious investor, listen to my quote or not my quote, but Rockefeller's quote that I put on my website, own nothing, control everything. You're crazy if you own all of your assets in your own name because you're, you're putting a huge bullseye on your back. If you're a serious investor, get the proper structure set up in place for ownership of your assets, minimize that risk so that you can continue being the professional investor you are and continue to grow your business and grow your asset base because that's what matters for you and your family. So, do that to protect yourself, okay? Whether you call me or not, do it with somebody to figure out how to get it done and get it done correctly from the beginning. Um, whether and that's if you're just buying raw land in Montana or North Dakota too. Don't you know? Don't don't say, well, it's not international, so I don't need to have that place <laughs> that structure in place. Yes, you do. Um, let's see. My website, globalwealthprotection.com. We publish, uh, we publish a lot of content in there. We have articles that come out, usually two, sometimes three articles that come out a week. Uh, a lot of it's about economics, international investments, different global opportunities, that sort of thing. Sometimes it's just a political rant because we're sick of the stupid uh, um, political debates going on. Sometimes we just blow up about stuff like that. So... <clears throat> We publish a lot of content. You can subscribe to our free newsletter on there. You can read some of our content on the page. Um, and what was the last thing you said? A book. A book. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug a, a friend of mine's book. Maybe you've heard of the guy, James Altucher. He wrote a book called Choose Yourself. 
Um, I recommend that book to everybody. Um, I got the book for my kids. I think it's an amazing book and it really, to me, it really helped me think about some things in a different way, especially for the future, the next 10 and 20 years on the way things are going. So I don't want to give too much away about the book. It's a cheap book. It's a few bucks on Amazon. So um, James, you're welcome. If you listen to this, I plug your book for the hundredth time. All right. I, I love it. I'm trying to get James Altucher on the show actually. Um, and uh, so if you're friends with him, let him know. We'll do. Yeah, I can do that. He's, he's a good guy. He's tough to get on a show though. I can tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some of his advice is amazing as far as, you know, giving out 10 ideas a day. Right. <laughs> Yeah, his daily practice. Um, his yep. daily practice. I, I love that. I love that. Uh, yes. Scott Todd, no doubt. what's your All tip right. of the week? Mark, I, I don't know how I can compare to like the three that we just got, right? But let, check this out. Mark, go to Clark, like the man's name with an E at the end. Like maybe, I don't know if that's how they spell Clark shoes or not. I think it is. Clark with an E at the end, dot AI. Clark dot AI. Now, check this out. I'm checking it out. This service will dial into conference calls on your behalf. Take notes and email them to you. So for the person that's trying to leverage their time, I wish I would have found this when I had my corporate gig. I, I, would, I would have let this thing dial into some of these conference calls that I, um, that I uh, really didn't have to attend. It would have taken the notes for me, sent me the notes, I mean, think about this. If you can get, you know, conference calls, notes automated, ah, oh, what's that worth to you? Just to get an hour of your time back a, a month, this thing will do it all for you. <laughs> Scott Todd, this is an amazing, amazing tip because I use fancy hands to do this. I have them call, I have them go on and, and, and listen to uh, podcasts for me or uh, yeah. go on webinars and take notes and, yeah. This will do it. I have to, I have to try this. I mean, think okay, so like, uh, I'll wrong. give you real quick, this Clark.ai, I, yeah. I just I pulled it up right when you said it too. .ai is the domain registrar in Anguilla, which is, is where our corporate service business is. But you just brought it, you just made a point actually for me about planning multiple flags. These guys registered their domain in another jurisdiction because of uh, taking advantage of planting multiple flags. Anyway, that's just a funny point. But that's yeah, a good I that. I'm sure I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. I, yeah. I, I, I plan this to be flawless and seamless, just to make that point. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, you, your skill is yeah. unmatched. <laughs> wow. Well, what, right. is the, what is the domain register for IO? What is that? Dot IO? Yeah, dot .io. What country is that? I'll tell you just a second. There is dot .io. Because I know a wise man <laughs> that's using the .io domain. Lone geek. He's kind of like a he's kind of like a Yoda. Dot <laughs> <laughs> .io. Does where is it? It's a Brit it's a British overseas territory like Anguilla. Ah, there you go. All right, Mark, your tip. All right, so my tip of the week is, I, I don't know if we've ever formally have talked about it as a tip. I think everyone knows about it, I think, maybe not. But as far as communicating with your team, the Slack, like using Slack, and Slack, now they have Slack beta, and it's faster, um, that's going to be my tip of the week. Um, having your VA team in Slack and it's free is, is just phenomenal. Um, just a, a great way to communicate and get things done so much faster. So that's going to be my tip of the week, as well as scheduling a call. Go to support at thelandgeek.com and learn more about loangeek.io. Automate getting paid for less. And... Um, we're, we're crushing it. So we're in beta right now. It's great. Um, but learn more. Just email supportlandgeek.com. Subject, Lone Geek. And uh, we'll kind of walk you through it and go through a little demo. Um, Scott Todd, are we good? 
Mark, I think we're great. Bobby Casey, are we good? We're all good. This Thanks is really for having me on. Um, thanks so much for, for uh, taking time out of your valuable day and, uh, and, My and pleasure. spending time with us. Um, so, where, so where are you right now, Bobby? Latvia. Latvia. Unbelievable. Well, I'm going to be living vicariously through you. I'm going to be going to globalwealthprotection.com and learning more. Um, I do recommend everyone go there. And um, you don't know what you don't know. And I, I find this whole world very fascinating. So thanks again, Bobby. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. All right. Also, just a little reminder, if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, why not? Go to postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Forward slash the land geek. If you're interested in some wholesale land, go to landmoto.com forward slash wholesale. Go to frontierpropertiesusa.com as well. So, all right, enough plugging. Anyways, I want to thank all the listeners. Please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It really helps us. It's the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Bobby Casey to come on the podcast. Bobby's going to check out the podcast and be like, oh, who are these guys, right? And if we don't have any, any reviews, he's like, well, okay, I'll go on the James Altucher show instead, <laughs> right? So please do that. Um, and uh, if you have not registered for boot camp yet, boot camp is coming up October 21st through 23rd. We have 10 spots left as of this recording today. Um, Scott Todd. It's going to be huge. Mark, I, I'm excited about boot camp. I love boot camp. All right. Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Thanks, everybody.